So we've, um, we've labeled this uh, series, uh, this Advent series, um, a season of giving, getting, waiting, and watching. And so today we're going to talk about watching, especially watching what God can do in our lives because he is constantly at work. Now, when Jesus Christ gave his longest sermon called the Sermon on the Mount, which is recorded in the Gospel of Matthew, he makes this outrageous statement in chapter 5, verse 48. He says, be perfect as your Father in heaven is perfect. Be perfect as your Father in heaven is perfect. Well, how's that going to work? I mean, what? Well, he's calling us, God calls us to a radical kind of holiness such that our lives mirror Jesus and mirror the perfection of God the Father. But the truth is, of course, we can't do this on our own. This kind of radical transformation, this change, uh, is, it's called sanctification. And God moves in us, sets us apart to change us through this process of sanctification. And indeed, my dear friends, it's a process. It's not like, you know, it's not like Dream of Jeannie where she just does that, or it's not like, you know, Bewitched where she wiggles her nose and then you're just all good to go. No. It's a process. In fact, um, just a turn to your neighbor, or if you're alone, just say, uh, I'm a work in progress. Turn to your neighbor and say, you're a work in progress. I love how you like to do that, <laughs> Not if I with you, you're a work in progress. <laughs> but you know, so, I'm going to read these texts that talk about God's work in us. An affirmation, a reaffirmation, an acknowledgement that God is always at work within us. So I'm going to read, first I'm going to read out of the message translation. This is Paul's letter to um, the church at Ephesus from chapter 3, verses 20 and 21. Um, marvelous verses. Here's from the message. God, you can do anything, you know, far more than you could ever imagine or guess or request in your wildest dreams. He does it not by pushing us around, but by working within us. So if, you, if you're so inclined, underline that, working within us, his spirit deeply and gently within us. Glory to God in the church. Glory to God in the Messiah. In Jesus, glory all the generations. Glory down to all the generations. Glory to all millennia. Oh, yes. So we see how Paul says, watch, God's working within you. You're a work in progress. Here's the same uh, verses, the same verses from the Amplified Version. Now to him who is able to carry out his purpose and do super abundantly, I love that word, super abundantly, more than all that we dare ask or think infinitely beyond our greatest prayers, hopes, or dreams, according to his power that is at work within us. You see again that phrase, working within us. To him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. And then finally, again, from Paul. He's now in prison. He's writing to the church in Philippi. These are words back then for the people that were following him, also for us today as followers of Jesus Christ. He reminds us, I am convinced and confident of this very thing, that he who began a good work where? Within us, in you, will continue to perfect and complete it until the day of Christ Jesus, the time of his return. 
Now, most of us, if we've been in the church for any um, length of time, we know about Paul, about his transformation, how, how God worked an incredible um, change within him. Uh, Paul, you know, was at the stoning death of the first known martyr of the Christian church. The first martyr of the Christian church, that is a person who died for the Christian faith, was Stephen, St. Stephen. And it's recorded in Acts chapter 7 that Paul was there at the stoning death of Stephen. It says that those who were involved in stoning Stephen took off their coats and they laid them at Paul's feet. Why did they take off their coats? Well, the thing is, stoning a person to death, hot, heavy work. First of all, the uh, guilty are buried, helpless into the ground, waist high or sometimes shoulder high. And then those who have gathered to judge them, pellet them with rocks and stones and boulders of all different sizes until they are bruised, bloodied, and breathless until they are finally dead. It takes time, it takes effort, it's not a queen click, a clean, quick form of capital punishment, it's not like a lethal injection, it's not even as merciful as hanging or firing squad. No, this is slow, it's torturous, it's grisly, and we're told that Paul just stood there at best. At best, Paul just stood there and did nothing but watch. But we don't know. Maybe Paul actually threw a stone or two or more. Maybe Paul actually, I don't know, threw the final stone that killed Stephen. We don't know. But yet this same man, Paul, is chosen by God after this amazing change, to watch the change within him, to go on to write almost half of the New Testament. But he knows, Paul himself knows, he is a work in progress. He's very, very aware that even after his change, even after God has changed him from within, he knows he's a work in progress. And I love the way he puts it in Romans chapter 7. This is from the New Living Translation. I love it because I can relate to it so well. He says, the trouble is with me, for I'm all too human, a slave to sin. I don't really understand myself. For what I want to do, what is right, but I don't do it. Instead, I do what I hate. Oh, what a miserable person I am. Who will free me from this life that is dominated by sin and death? Thank God the answer is in Jesus Christ. So he is now acknowledging and reminding us that this holy process of changing us from the inside out, this process of sanctification. This is what God does. What's our job? Our job is to listen, to, obedient, to be obedient, to yield to the Spirit, and let the Lord work in and with and through us. Because we can't do it on our own, even if we have really, you know, a season of, you know, I'm behaving really well. I think I'm doing really well. Let's face it. It's like a diet. It eventually, you know, you just give in, you give up, and, and, and we struggle. But God is always there. And here's what he says to the Old Testament prophet Zechariah. He says, I am the Lord all-powerful. So don't depend on your own power or strength, but on my spirit. So we need to yield and then watch God do what he does best, which is change us, to make us radically holy, to help us to achieve more of the image of the Father, to be more like him and less like us. When we allow this process of sanctification and when we allow it to shine through, 
we need to give the praise and the glory to God, not to ourselves. We shouldn't be patting ourselves on the back. Oh, I'm all that. No, it's like the pastor, the story of the pastor who was greeting folks at the door after the service was over. And a, a woman came up to him and, and said, Pastor, that was a very good sermon. And the pastor humbly replied and said, Oh, I have to give all the credit to the Holy Spirit. To which she said, Well, it wasn't that good. <laughs> In Philippians, Philippians, Paul reminds us, it is God who produces in you the desires and actions that please him. It's God working in us through this process of sanctification, making us holier, 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 called to radical holiness. Here's how author Patrick Morley describes this notion of holiness and sanctification. He wrote a book called Walking with Christ, in the details of life. The holiness we are to exhibit is not our own, but the holiness of Christ in us. We are not holy, and we will not become holy humans. Christ in us can manifest his holiness if we yield our flesh to him. This is not a human operation, it's a spiritual one. Jesus installs his holiness in us by grace. Not a once for all time transaction. This is a daily moment by moment striving to live more by the spirit and less by the flesh. And then he goes on to give this example. He says, a friend bought his daughter a new car, but it must sit in the garage until she reaches the legal driving age. Until her 16th birthday, she only has partial use of the car when accompanied by an adult. Similarly, he says, holiness is like a gift already purchased for us by the blood of Christ, but we cannot have full use of it until a certain date in the future. And that means, of course, after we die and we attain full sanctification, and then we are made absolutely perfect in the holiness of God. Becoming holy is a process which, in God, which includes God's part and our part. On the one hand, our part is to stay, stay out of God's business, out of his part, to yield, to surrender, to stop seeking on our own. But our part is also to yield and obey. We need to obey. We need to yield to the Spirit and then watch God do what he does best. And that, of course, is continuing to sanctify us. So, the problem is, many problems, sometimes we want God only to go so far in his work on our holiness. The sad truth is that we like some of our sins. Sometimes they just feel too good to let go of and give up. Christian author C.S. Lewis touches on this very problem. He talks about when he was a child, and he often suffered from toothaches, and he knew if he went to his mama, she would give him something to ease the pain. But he would put off going to her until it was almost completely unbearable, because he also knew she was going to take him to the dentist. And uh, he says, I knew those dentists. I knew they started fiddling about with all sorts of other teeth, teeth which had not begun to ache. And then he goes on to say, Our Lord is like the dentist. Dozens of people go to him to be cured of some particular sin. Well, he will cure it all right, but he will not stop there. That may be all you ask, but if you once call him in, he will give you the full treatment. So do you want the full treatment? Do you want to be wholly sanctified? You know, some people, um, they're chronic worriers, and they've gotten to the point where they actually enjoy worrying. That's, all they, that's their full-time job. They're worriers. Uh, I have many people who come to me uh, in counseling or whatever, and they say, I'm just so worried. Da, 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 da. And uh, 
Believe it or not, worry is a sin. And, and I know that we all do it. It's part of the human condition, but the word says, be anxious for nothing. Don't worry about it. But in everything, by prayer and supplication, make your requests known to God. Don't worry, pray. Don't worry, pray. The prophet Jeremiah says, this he says god says yet i still dare to hope when i remember this the faithful love of the lord never ends his mercies never cease great is his faithfulness his mercies begin afresh every morning we need to remember we're under construction this process of sanctification is god's rehabilitation program and so that's why Paul writes, you know, I, I'm confident God began a good work in you and he'll be faithful to complete it. Max Lucado tells a story about his daughter Jenna when she was a toddler. He says one day as she was playing in a sandbox, an ice cream salesman approached us. I purchased her a treat and when I turned to give it to her, I saw her mouth was full of sand. And when, where I intended to put a delicacy, she had put dirt. Did I love her with dirt in her mouth? Absolutely. Was she any less my daughter with dirt in her mouth? Of course not. Was I going to allow her to keep the dirt in her mouth? No way. I love her right where she was, but I refused to leave her there. I carried her over to the water fountain and I washed out her mouth. Why? Because I love her. And he says, God does the same for us. He holds us over the fountain. Spit out the dirt, honey. Our father urges, I've got something better for you. And so he cleanses us. He cleanses us from the filth of immorality and dishonesty and prejudice and greed and worry. We don't enjoy the cleansing. Sometimes we often opt for the dirt over the ice cream. I can eat dirt if I want to, we pout and proclaim, which is true, we can. But if we do, the loss is ours. God has a better offer. He wants us to be just like Jesus. And that, oh my dear friends, that is good, good news. So, are you willing? Are you willing to participate in this process? Are you willing to yield to the Spirit? Are you willing to ask God, change me from the inside out? I want to watch and see what you're going to do because I know you have some spectacular, spectacular agenda for me. You have a plan and a purpose for my life and I want to live into that. Anybody remember the British pop singer, songwriter, Amy Winehouse? Do you remember that name? Amy Winehouse. I'm getting like, okay, Amy, okay. So Amy, um, she wrote a song, which was the song of the year in 2008, and the song was Rehab. And the lyrics were, they tried to make me go to rehab. I said, no, no, no. He's trying to make me go to rehab. I won't go, go, go. Sadly, at the age of 27, brilliant light, brilliant songwriter, great singer, Amy Winehouse died. She died of alcohol poisoning because she wouldn't go to rehab. We are often reluctant to enter into God's rehab process, to the sanctification process. But that doesn't deter God from still working within us. He's always at work within us. So I'm gonna close with this story. It's one of my favorite stories of sanctification and transformation. It's written by a Christian author, Josh McDowell, and here's what he writes. This is in the prelude. He's speaking about himself. He writes, I grew up filled with hatred. 
primarily aimed at one man whom I hated more than anyone else on the face of this earth. I despite everything this man stood for. I can remember as a young boy lying in bed at night, plotting how I would kill this man without being caught by the police. This man was my father. While I was growing up, my father was the town drunk. I hardly ever saw him sober. My friends at school would joke about my dad lying in the gutter downtown, making a fool of himself. Their jokes hurt me deeply, but I never let anyone know. I laughed along with them and I kept my pain a secret. I would sometimes find my mother in the barn, lying in the manure behind the cows where my dad had beaten her with a hose until she couldn't get up. My hatred seethed as I vowed to myself, when I am strong enough, I'm gonna kill him. When dad was drunk and visitors were coming over, I would grab him around the neck, pull him out to the barn, and tie him up. Then I would park his truck behind a silo and tell everyone he had gone to a meeting so we wouldn't be embarrassed as a family. When I tied up his hands and feet, I looped part of the rope around his neck. I just hoped he would try to get away and choke himself. Two months before I graduated from high school, I walked into the house after a date to hear my mother sobbing. I ran into her room and she sat up in bed. Son, your father has broken my heart, she said. She put her arms around me and pulled me close. I have lost the will to live. All I want to do is live until you graduate. Then I want to die. Two months later, I graduated, and the following Friday, my mother died. I believe she died of a broken heart. I hated my father for that. Had I not left home a few months after the funeral to attend college, I might have killed him. But after I made a decision to place my trust in Jesus as Lord and Savior, the love of God inundated my life. He took my hatred for my father and turned it upside down. Five months after becoming a Christian, I found myself looking my dad right in the eye and saying, Dad, I love you. I did not want to love that man, but I did. God's love had changed my heart. After I transferred to Wheaton, University. I was in a serious car accident, the victim of a drunk driver. I was moved home from the hospital to recover and my father came to see me. Remarkably, he was sober that day. He seemed uneasy, pacing back and forth in my room. Then he blurted out, how can you love a father like me? I said, Dad, Six months ago, I hated you. I despised you. But I have put my trust in Jesus Christ, received God's forgiveness, and he has changed my life. I can't explain it all, Dad, but God has taken away my hatred for you and replaced it with love. We talked for nearly an hour. Then he said, son, if God can do in my life what I've seen him do in yours, then I want to give him the opportunity. He prayed, God, if you're really God, and Jesus died on the cross to forgive me for what I have done to my family, I need you. If Jesus can do in my life what I've seen him do in the life of my son, then I want to trust him as Savior and Lord. Hearing my dad pray this prayer from his heart was one of the greatest joys of my life. After I trusted Christ, my life was basically changed in six to 18 months. 
but my father's life was changed right before my eyes. It was like someone reached down and switched on a light inside him. He touched alcohol only once after that. He got the drink only as far as his lips and that was it. After 40 years of drinking, he didn't need it anymore. 14 months later, he died from complications of his alcoholism. But in that 14 month period, over a hundred people in the area around my tiny hometown committed their lives to Jesus Christ because of the change they saw in the town drunk, my dad. You can laugh at Christianity, you can mock and ridicule it, but it works. If you trust Christ, start watching. Start watching your attitudes and actions because Jesus Christ is in the business of changing lives. Amen. Please join in singing our next. No, don't join us. Listen. Listen, people. We're going to have some really great music. We're going to, no, we're going to do, well, yes. So, okay. Let's do a little rewind. Pastor Mary, pay attention to the bulletin. We're going to do communion now. All right, let's do that. 